Hi everybody, welcome back and welcome if you're new. Today I'm going to be reacting to Mr. Ballin. I haven't done his videos in a while. Um, this one's called This Demon Still Lives Among Us. It's actually number 8 on trending, which is really cool. I'm so happy that Mr. Ballin has grown so much. I think he really deserves it. I mean, he put so much into his videos. He does a lot of research and the way he tells stories are just very captivating and it shows you know his he has five million subscribers which you know really cool but yeah let's just get right into it this video is brought to you by hello fresh sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction and today we're going to look at three stories that demonstrate that but before we get into today's stories if you're a fan of the strange dark and mysterious delivered in story format then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once or twice every week so if that's of interest to you please go to the like button's place of work one minute before closing time and then proceed to browse around for about 30 minutes and then leave without buying anything also please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications Applications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. I'm pretty sure they would just kick you out if you did that. <laughs> In 1957, 31-year-old Larry Bader was living with his wife, Mary Lou, and their three kids in Akron, Ohio. Larry was a good father and good husband, but he was a terrible businessman. Over the past several years, he had launched several new business ventures, and they had all failed, throwing the family into fairly significant debt. And so even though Larry desperately wanted to be an entrepreneur and eventually start a quality business, they didn't have the money to do that. And so he had to just take some job in order to pay the bills. And and so the job he got was a cookware salesman for a local company and it did pay the bills but it did not make larry happy and so on the weekends when larry was not working and if it was okay with his wife he would basically just disappear and go fishing on lake erie which is about an hour north of where they lived and that was his way of kind of disconnecting from reality and kind of disconnecting from his somewhat crappy life and so on friday march 15th larry approached his wife and said hey you know i'd like to head up to lake erie and go fishing for the weekend and she would tell him, you know, I got the kids, it's fine, you can go do that, but I heard the weather was going to be really bad. Are you sure that's such a good idea? And Larry would tell her, you know what, don't worry about it. These storms, they always hype them up. They're never a big deal. I'll be fine. And so he kissed his wife, he kissed his kids, he grabbed his stuff, he hopped in his truck, then he left and headed up to Lake Erie. That night, Lake Erie was hit with a massive thunderstorm, way bigger than the one that the news was predicting. And then the following morning, the Coast Guard discovered Larry's boat floating around around on Lake Erie. There was minor damage to it and it was missing an oar and it was missing Larry. Larry was nowhere to be found. And so a search was launched for Larry, but he was never found and he was eventually declared dead. And so even though the family did not have Larry's body, they would hold a funeral for him and his wife was able to actually cash his life insurance policy, which was enough to pay for her and the kids. Eight years later, in 1965, Larry Bader's niece, a 21-year-old woman named Suzanne Peka, was in Chicago at a sporting goods show with a friend of hers. And as they're walking through the different Wait, was how in many Chicago, Larry later? Bader's niece ate and the kids. Eight years later, oh, eight in years. 1965, Larry Bader's niece, a 21-year-old woman named Suzanne Peka, was in Chicago at a sporting goods show with a friend of hers. And as they're walking through the different exhibits, looking at different sporting goods equipment, they noticed over on the side of the building, there was a fairly large group of people gathered around this one particular exhibit. And so she and her friend she was with walked over to this group and they kind of pushed their way through. And in the middle of this group was this man with an eye patch and a big mustache doing an archery demonstration. Basically, he was shooting arrows into a target about 30 feet away. And so Suzanne and her friend just kind of watched this guy for a couple of minutes. And very quickly, they could see why he was attracting this big crowd because he was just an incredible archer. He was hitting the bullseye over and over and over again. But as they continued to watch this guy, Suzanne's friend started to notice something unique about him. And he eventually turned to Suzanne and said, hey, doesn't this guy look exactly like your uncle who went missing on Lake Erie? 
and Suzanne was kind of surprised to hear him talking about her missing uncle, but she turned and looked at this guy, and all of a sudden she saw it too. He was a spitting image of Larry Bader, her uncle, although this guy had an eye patch and a mustache, but even with that, he looked exactly like Larry. And as Suzanne is watching him, she's thinking, you know, Larry was known for being this incredible Wait, what? So he he used the boat too. Did he just run away? Incredible archer, and here this guy is. Not run away, but like disappear on purpose. Who looks just like him, and he's an incredible archer. And so after this demonstration was over, Suzanne and the friend ran over to this guy with the eye patch on, and Suzanne says to him, Hey, I know this sounds totally crazy, but you look exactly like my uncle, Larry Bader, who went missing on Lake Erie eight years ago. And so the guy, he hears her and he kind of smiles and says, You know, I'm sorry, I, I don't know Larry Bader. My name is John Johnson. People call me Fritz. I, I, I'm so. John Johnson that doesn't sound very made up. <laughs> Sorry, I don't, I don't know who your uncle is. I, I can't help you. But Suzanne, as she stood there staring at this guy, she was becoming more and more convinced this was Larry Bader, despite the fact this guy is saying he is not Larry Bader. And so she says to him, no, you are Larry Bader. I'm, I'm positive. You're my uncle. Now at this, Fritz would be polite, but firm. And he would reiterate that, look, I'm not your uncle. I don't know who Larry Bader is. Maybe he had I don't a go to Lake Erie. I, I just don't understand why you think I'm him. I live in Omaha, Nebraska with my wife and my kids and I'm on TV. I, I do sports journalism in Omaha and I advise archery companies. And that's, that's why I'm here. So I, I don't know why you think I'm your uncle, but I'm not. I'm sorry. And with that, Fritz turned around and he walked away. And after this discussion, Suzanne and her friend were not remotely deterred from what Fritz was saying. They were completely <laughs> convinced this was Larry Bader. And so they ran to a phone and Suzanne called her two other uncles, so Larry Bader's brothers. And she explained how she met this guy that is the spitting image of their brother. And they immediately hopped on a flight that night and flew to Chicago. Jeez. And the following morning, the they really believed it. <laughs> two uncles, along with Suzanne and her friend, they went back to the sporting goods show. They went over to the archery exhibit, and sure enough, there was Fritz doing his archery demonstration. And as soon as there was a break, Suzanne, her friend, and now the two uncles, so Larry Bader's brothers, they walk over, and the two uncles, as soon as they see this guy, despite the eye patch, despite the mustache, they too would say, this is our brother. And so they approached him and they said, look, I know you're saying you are not our brother. I don't know what's going on here, but you look exactly like our brother. And we have his military paperwork right here with fingerprints. Will you please just humor us and go to the police station with us and get fingerprinted? That way you can prove you really are not our brother. Please, we've been looking for our brother for a long time. This would be a huge favor to us. And so Fritz was annoyed. He didn't want to do it, but he's like, okay, fine. I'll go to the police station with you. I'll get my fingerprints taken and we can put this behind us. And so that day they left the Sporting Goods show. They went to a police station and Fritz had his fingerprints taken. And afterwards the police would tell him, you are Larry Bader. When Fritz heard this, he could not believe- Wait, do identical twins have the same fingerprints? I don't think they do, right? It. I mean, he literally did not believe he was Larry Bader. It wasn't like this revelation prompted new memories and suddenly he recalled it all. It was really the opposite. Fritz immediately is trying to rack his brain to figure out, like, is my whole life a lie? But there was nothing. All he had was a contiguous stretch of memories from when he was a very young child as Fritz Johnson all the way to the present. But we now know that the bulk of his memories are all not real. He was never a child as Fritz Johnson. He was Larry Bader and then became Fritz Johnson only eight years earlier. The Wait, timeline of what happened to Larry Bader is rough at best. But as far as we understand it, Fritz Johnson showed up in Omaha, Nebraska a couple of days or a couple of months after Larry Bader went missing on Lake Erie. And when Fritz showed up in Omaha, he just walked into a restaurant and asked for a job there and he had provided documentation that showed he was in fact Fritz Johnson and nobody thought anything of it. He was completely normal. There was nothing unusual about his behavior. And over time, Fritz just kind of thread himself 
himself into the Omaha community. I mean, he got married. He had a child. He、What? adopted another child. He left his job as a bartender at a restaurant and eventually got this amazing job as a sports TV broadcaster for their local channel. I mean, he was like a minor celebrity in Omaha. Everybody recognized. Oh, there's Fritz Johnson. He's on TV. Hey, Fritz, how you doing?、What? I mean, he had a full blown life. But as soon as the news broke that he was not Fritz Johnson, he was Larry Bader. Right away, the TV station he worked for fired him. His second wife left him because, in reality, he actually was still legally married to his first wife, and so his marriage to his second wife was never actually real to begin with. And so she leaves him. And then also because Larry Bader was no longer dead, the insurance company that had paid out all that money to his first wife as part of his life insurance policy. They demanded that he repay them, and throughout all this drama of Fritz finding out, they should have left him alone. <laughs> Jesus, he's Larry Bader. <clears throat> Fritz continued to say he was not Larry Bader; that this was all a big mistake. He just could not understand how this could have happened. None of it made sense, and so eventually, a team of experts—doctors, psychologists, you name it—they came out to Omaha and they ran Fritz, aka Larry Bader, through a battery of tests over almost two weeks. And at the end of all their testing, they concluded that one, Fritz definitely is Larry Bader. So there's no debate there; he is Larry Bader. And two, he is almost certainly suffering from an extreme case of amnesia, which is memory loss. But the doctors and experts had no idea how he developed this case of amnesia.、Maybe、and of course, Fritz, he too had no idea how he developed this case of amnesia. And it's unlikely we'll ever get any more clarity on exactly what happened to Larry Bader slash Fritz, because unfortunately, just one year after it was discovered, Fritz was Larry Bader. Fritz would die. He had cancer in one of his eyes, and that was actually why he wore that eye patch. And the cancer had come back, and it took his life. Today, his case is considered、oh, no. to be one of the most believable and baffling cases of amnesia on record. Before we get into our next story, I want to talk to you about today's sponsor, HelloFresh. Back during the beginning of the pandemic, we were not able to get groceries or have food delivered to our house, and so before long, we were down to eating just the diet Cheetos and pickled licorice. And as I was eating, okay, why couldn't you go to the grocery store? <laughs> In my not the zombie apocalypse. Seventy seventh bag of diet Cheetos. <clears throat> I thought to myself, is there anything better for me to eat?、And、that's when I discovered Hello Fresh. Hello Fresh is like one of those things where, as soon as you have it, you think to yourself, how could I have ever lived without this? They send you this neat little box full of meals, and there's all these incredible meals to choose from, from fairly intricate to very quick and easy. And so, whatever your tastes are, they got it. But the catch is, they are not made. You are the chef, and you make the meals. And before you tell me that you're a bad chef, I'm a bad chef, and I'm able to <laughs> whip these meals together no problem because all the ingredients are perfectly proportioned, which also means you don't waste any food. And the recipes. His hair is so long. I remember when it was short. Are incredibly easy to follow. So the end product is home cooked, fresh, delicious food every time. So if your New Year's resolution is to eat better or to just stop snarfing as many Diet Cheetos, then you really need to sign up. Diet Cheetos? I didn't even know that was a thing. For HelloFresh. To do that, go to HelloFresh.com. Use the code MrBallin16 to get up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. Okay, back to the stories. It's cool he got、um, sponsored. Just outside of the popular tourist town of Amaga in northern Colombia lies this thick green jungle, and if you know where to look, there is actually a walking path that leads you from Amaga deep into this jungle. And if you keep going, it will bring you all the way to this terrifying, enormous old railroad bridge that spans this huge ravine. Now, this bridge is no longer used by trains; it's been decommissioned. However, since its decommissioning, there's actually been, ironically, more traffic on this bridge, although. 
it is the foot traffic variety. People come out to this bridge to go bungee jumping. Bungee jumping is a thrill-seeking activity where people will leap off of high places like this bridge and they'll jump with an elastic rope tied to their ankles. And so this rope has been very carefully measured so that when it is fully stretched all the way out, it ensures whoever has jumped will still not impact the ground. Back in early July of 2021, a 25-year-old Colombian lawyer named Yesenia Gomez, who lived about an hour north of Amaga in the larger city of Medellin, she told her boyfriend that she wanted to go bungee jumping. This was something Yesenia had talked about for a long time, wanting to go bungee jumping. Yesenia, isn't it Yesenia? <laughs> Thing. But every time it became a real thing and they were actually going to go do it, she would back down because she was just too scared. But for whatever reason, in July of 2021, Yesenia had the confidence and the courage to actually see this thing through. And so her boyfriend, when he heard how serious she was, he capitalized on the opportunity because he had never bungee jumped before and he really wanted to, but he couldn't without his girlfriend. And so now it seemed like she was serious. I would never. That's just... So many things can go wrong. And so right away, he called the Amaga Bungee Jumping Company to book a slot for he and Yesenia to jump off of their bridge. So on the day they were supposed to jump, which was Sunday, July 18th, Yesenia and her boyfriend hopped in their car and they drove an hour south to Amaga. And when they got there, they found the walking trail and they made their way out to this bridge. And when they get out to this bridge, they are amazed at the number of people who were already in line on this bridge waiting to jump off of it. They knew this was a popular spot, but perhaps they didn't realize just how popular it was. And so Yesenia and her boyfriend, they get in line behind the nearly 100 other jumpers ahead of them, Please. and they proceed to wait. And over the next several hours, Yesenia and her boyfriend would have front row seats to all of the jumpers ahead of them jumping off the bridge. Now, it seems like Yesenia, in her mind, believed she would arrive at this bridge and very quickly she and her boyfriend would leap off and it would be great and so much fun. But now they've been forced to wait for a really long time. And this whole time, they're watching other people jump and Yesenia is starting to panic. Suddenly, bungee jumping looked terrifying. It did not look like something she wanted to do. And so she was beginning to second guess her decision. And so her boyfriend, he's trying to calm her down and he's telling her, oh, it's totally safe. Look at all these people who have jumped. They're all fine. They're all smiling. They're so happy. You're going to be so proud of yourself. But despite his best efforts to calm his girlfriend down, Yesenia just could not calm down. But she did tell her boyfriend that she's not about to back down. She's going to go through with this. Oh, no. So several hours went by of this totally high stress, anxious waiting period and then finally Yesenia and her boyfriend reached the front of the line at which point the staff members who've been doing this all day long they signal the two to step forward and get their harnesses on and so Yesenia and her boyfriend they make their way to the edge of the platform so they're looking out over this ravine and the staff members are putting on their harnesses and getting them ready and the whole time Yesenia she's starting to get tunnel vision her heart is racing she's totally panicked she doesn't think this is fun at all she just wants to get this over with and then at some point one of the staff members finally says, okay, jump. And so Yesenia jumps. Except it would turn out Yesenia had made a mistake. That staff member who had said, okay, jump, was talking to her boyfriend, not Yesenia. However, Yesenia, in her totally panicked state, had just not understood and had leapt, believing they were telling her to jump. However, the staff members had only put her harness on. They had not attached the actual elastic rope to her ankles. And so when Yesenia jumped, there was nothing stopping her from smashing into the ground. And so as soon as she leapt oh off the bridge, God. her boyfriend ripped off all of his gear and he ran down the bridge. He leapt over the railing and he ran down the hillside all the way to the bottom of this ravine. But when he finally got to his girlfriend, it was already too late. She was already gone. It would later be determined Yesenia Senia did not die from impacting the ground. She actually died from a heart attack she suffered on the fall down, which means she must have realized after she jumped that she jumped too early, that she did not have the bungee cord attached to her legs. And so literally the fear of what was about to happen to her killed her. Oh my God, that's absolutely horrible. Well, at least... She didn't die from the impact. I think that would have been worse.
In early 1974, 31-year-old Michael Taylor was living happily with his wife Christine and their five Her. children in Osset. I think when when you really have a bad feeling about something, just don't do it. There's a reason. It doesn't matter how many people are doing it, just don't do it. Which is a small town in central England. Michael was described as a great father and a great husband who had an excellent sense of humor. In fact, neighbors, whenever they would walk past the Taylor household, would say you could often hear the sound of Michael laughing or the sound of him telling jokes to his family. But in April of that year, everything changed for the Taylor family. Michael had been doing some home repairs when he fell off of a ladder and he hurt his back. The injury itself was fairly minor, but it resulted in chronic pain, and this chronic pain quickly changed how Michael behaved. Michael went from being this cheerful, funny, happy guy to being sad and depressed, and he was so irritable that his family could barely be around him because he would lash out at them. Now, the Taylor family was not a religious family. However, most families who lived in Osset at that time were. And so when one of Michael's friends found out about how poorly Michael was doing, they approached Michael and said, you know, you really ought to turn to religion for help and for guidance in this difficult time. And they also told him specifically that he really ought to check out this one particular Christian group. It was called the Christian Fellowship Group, and all it was was a prayer group for Christians who wanted more religious support beyond just going to church on Sundays. But this friend of Michael's told him that the real draw of this group was the group's leader. Her name was Marie Robinson, and she was this 21-year-old, extremely friendly and energetic and charismatic person who just had this incredible way of making all of her members really feel like they belonged. And so Michael's friend was telling him that he really thought Marie could be the difference maker for him, that she could help him get back to normal. And so Michael, you know, he trusted this friend and he really didn't have much to lose at this point. He was already at rock bottom. And so he agrees to go check this group out. So on September 12th of that year, Michael makes his way to the church where this fellowship group is held. He goes inside and he makes his way to one of the back rooms in the church and when he goes inside he sees there's a ring of people sitting in a circle about 20 people and as soon as they see Michael coming in the room they all stand up and they open their arms up and they say come on come sit down with us welcome welcome to the group and then the woman who had to be Marie she stands up and she looks at Michael huge smile on her face and she encourages him to come over and sit right next to me welcome we'd love to have you join our group and so Michael for the first time in ages is smiling as he strides across the room and sits down right next to Marie. And then as Marie began to lead the group in prayer, Michael did not feel his chronic pain. He just felt happy again. But when the meeting was over and Michael went back home again, the pain and depression came flooding back. It was like the only place he could be happy was inside of the church at this fellowship group. And so over the next couple of weeks, Michael completely prioritized this group. He went to all of their meetings, and over the course of these couple of weeks, Michael became very close with Marie, and apparently Marie became very close with Michael, to the point where the two of them would stay after, after the meetings were over, and just those two would sequester themselves in quiet prayer. No one knew what they did in there, but it just seemed like they were developing a real relationship. And in fact, many people in this group suspected they were having an affair. And before long, the rumors in the church had spread outside and were all over Osset. And then before long, Christine, Michael's wife, was hearing from a friend or a neighbor that apparently Michael was having an affair with Marie. Now, Christine had already suspected her husband was having an affair with Marie because Marie was the only thing Michael talked about when he got home. So on October 1st of that year, only a couple of weeks after Michael had first attended this group, Christine waited until Michael had left the house to head out to one of the group meetings and then Christine hopped in her car and she followed him to the church and when she got there she parked her car she took a deep breath and then she got out she made her way to the front doors of the church and she stormed inside and she found the room where these meetings were held she barges in and she points at her husband and she says I know you're having an affair with Marie then you're gonna admit it in front of this whole group and Michael who's sitting with his back to his wife in one of the chairs he stands up and instead of addressing his wife 
wife who's accused him of infidelity. He turns and looks at Marie on the other side of the room. And when Marie made eye contact with Michael, she screamed. She would later say Michael did not look human. He looked like a beast and he had wild eyes. And so as Michael is standing there staring at Marie with this very aggressive face, he began breaking out in tongues. Speaking in tongues is where the speaker will be saying or uttering words or sounds that sound like I did not expect that. <laughs> language, but the speaker doesn't know what they mean. The idea is some entity has come inside of their body and this entity is dictating their speech. And so Michael is broken out in tongues. He's barking these words and sounds at Marie and everyone inside of the room has no idea what to make of this. Everything has happened so suddenly and it's so surprising. You have the wife suddenly coming in and aggressively accusing her husband of cheating and Michael is not responding to it and he's acting totally crazy. And then before anyone can do anything, Michael goes from just barking in strange languages at Marie to suddenly rushing across the room as if he's going to attack her. And when he does that, the rest of the members jump on top of him and hold him down. And despite there being like 10 or 15 people holding him down, Michael is still trying to get up and he's screaming and snarling and yelling at Marie. And then Marie suddenly breaks out into tongues too. And it's only then that Michael stops trying to force himself up out of this pig pile that's on top of him and instead he just continues to speak in tongues to her and so the two of them what are looking at each other name? speaking in tongues and the rest of the group is just totally dumbfounded and so they just begin praying and then after about an hour Michael just collapses it's like he went unconscious and at that point everybody in the room just goes silent and they look at Michael and then Michael kind of opens his eyes and it's almost like he's waking up and he begins looking around frantically trying to figure out what had just happened Michael would claim he had no memory memory of Maybe they worship the devil or something. What had just happened to him? And so at this point, Marie would tell him and Christine that she believed Michael was possessed by a demonic force and the only thing they could do at this point would be to perform an exorcism. And what about Marie? She was doing the same thing. Exorcism is an expulsion or attempted expulsion of a supposedly evil spirit inside of a person or a place. Michael and Christine were at a loss. They had no idea what to do in this situation. They were both kind of in shock for very very different reasons and so they just kind of deferred to Marie's judgment and said yeah you know I think an exorcism is the way to go so Christine and Michael just leave the church and go home and then the next morning Marie would get in touch with the Anglican Church of England and would request an exorcism and after hearing about what was going on with Michael the Anglican Church would say yeah that does sound like he needs an exorcism and so the following day they would send out two of their best exorcists named Peter and Raymond and so Peter and Raymond they get to Osset, they go to Michael's house, and they observe him, and very quickly, they determine that it does seem like Michael is possessed by at least one demonic force. And so they tell Michael, the only thing we can do here is perform this exorcism, but we need you to agree to it. And so Michael says, okay, yeah, I agree to this exorcism, and so would his wife, because she at this point is just completely unsure what to do. She's just going along for the ride. So a day later, on October 4th at 10 p.m., Michael, his wife, and the rest of the members of this fellowship group, along with Peter and Raymond, they would all meet at this other church in a neighboring town. And as soon as Michael had been positioned in the middle of this group in this chair, Peter and Raymond began the ritual by praying. And as soon as they did, Michael began screaming out in tongues and he began writhing around and he fell to the ground and he began I found the secret right? <laughs> and contorting his body in grotesque positions as if the words Peter and Raymond were saying were physically harming Michael. And so after eight hours of this, during which they had to actually tie Michael down to prevent him from hurting other members or hurting himself, after eight hours, they finally just came to a stop. Peter and Raymond were exhausted. It looked very much like Michael too was exhausted. And as soon as they stopped the ritual, Michael just kind of collapsed on the ground as if he had fallen unconscious and then at some point he kind of wakes up and he's looking around wildly he's still tied down to the ground and he's acting like he has no idea what's just happened and at this point Peter and Raymond they tell him that you know the exorcism was mostly successful we identified 40 demons inside of you and this Jesus. exorcism was able to expel 37 of them so that means there's still three demons inside of you now we can't do it right now we're too tired you're too exhausted so 
go home, get some rest, and tomorrow we will finish this exorcism. We will get rid of those three demons and you will be just fine. And so Michael and Christine, they get their things and uh -huh. they leave the church and they head home. A few hours later, around noon, a woman who lived near where Michael Taylor and his family lived thought she heard something strange outside of her house. It sounded like someone yelling. And so she went to the front of the house and she pulled the curtain aside on one of her windows and outside walking down the street completely naked, covered in blood, was Michael Taylor. And he was saying something about Satan. And so this woman, she calls the police. The police show up and they find Michael. He had curled up on the sidewalk outside of this woman's house and he was giggling like a child in the fetal position. And so the police approach him and at some yeah. point Michael apparently snaps out of it and he starts looking up at the police like he has no idea what's going on and eventually they would get him to tell them his name and where he lived and so after calling in backup to deal with Michael the responding officers made their way to Michael's residence and so they go inside and immediately as soon as they see what's in there one of the officers just turns around and runs outside and begins dry heaving the inside of the Taylor family home would become one of the most infamous crime scenes in English history a few hours earlier when Michael and his wife had come home from the exorcism they had gone inside and then Michael had fallen into one of his trances and began beating his wife mm. and then at some point she fell to the ground and either was dead or was in the process of dying at which point Michael jumped on top of her and using only his hands he ripped her face off and flung it across the room and then as she's laying there bleeding to death he began rubbing her blood all over his body and then after she had finally died he tracked down the family dog and killed the dog as well <gasps> fortunately the their five children were not home at the time of this attack and so they were unharmed during michael's trial the prosecution Thankfully. and the defense blamed the Anglican Church of England and Marie and her religious group for effectively convincing Michael he was possessed with demons, which caused him to act out violently and kill his wife. And so ultimately, Michael would be found not guilty by reason of insanity. What? And after only four years of psychiatric care, he was released. And today, he is still living free in Osset. But despite what? the legal outcomes of this case, there are many people, both religious and not religious, who believe the Michael Taylor case is one of the only true demonic possession cases in modern history. Also, just to close the loop, we don't know for sure if Michael and Marie were having an affair, but it is assumed they were. And so that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments section what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comments section. If you got something... That was crazy. So that was Mr. Bolin. This demon still lives among us. Now I know why the title is what it is. Um, I don't know if that was... Um, I do believe that people can get possessed, but I don't, I've never heard of anything like that. And, and he was supposedly in a church praying like every day. So how did that happen? Um, just, I know like just cause it's a church doesn't mean that you can't get possessed or whatever. But if he was supposedly praying every day, like, they should have questioned her, like, what were you doing in those rooms by yourself? Like, maybe she, they were worshipping the devil or something, but... And nobody talked about, like, how she was speaking in tongues, too. Like, she should have been... She should have had an exorcism, too, because... I don't know, it, that just didn't make sense to me, and... But, good thing their kids weren't there. I feel bad for his wife, though, but... In four years! doesn't make any sense if you're crazy you shouldn't be let go in four years like it doesn't make any sense especially if you kill somebody in a horrible way in the first story i think maybe he like hurt his head during that storm or something or maybe he was just pretending that he didn't remember because his life was just not happy um but it sucks that he died just a year later and after he was finally like happy but um and the second one oh my gosh the poor girl it's terrible but at least she didn't die on impact i think that would have been worse also the staff um in the 
bungee jumping place should be all fired and that whole thing should be either taken down or they should redo the safety precautions because why would you tell somebody to jump if they're not even connected to the rope? I know they were talking to the other person, which was her boyfriend, but why would you risk that? Shouldn't you put the equipment first away from the ledge, number one? It's just so... This is such a negligent thing to do. And literally, you have to have no brain to think that that's a good idea. To have two people ready to bungee jump and say, Okay, jump! While the other person isn't even ready or connected to the cord. And having two people stand there at once is dangerous in itself. It gets just so dumb, and that could have been avoided completely, but it's just really unfortunate, and yeah, they're completely 100% responsible for her death, and I hope that they were at least sued for it, or at least had the safety precautions made better because of that. I don't know, but what did you guys think? Let me know. Especially the last one, did you guys think it was really a possession, or do you think he was faking it, or... um. I think everybody can agree, though, that he shouldn't have been let go in four years. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't make any sense. But, yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I hope you guys have a great day or night, and I hope to see you guys next time.